Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December 26th episode of Pub Talk Live, the live publishing talk show that airs the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, um, except for the second one in January, by the way. Um, I'm your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author, a board member, and agent liaison for Pitch Wars, and a library event planner. Uh, you can subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking on the link in the description so you don't miss a show. You can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Pub Talk Live. And if you'd like to support the show, you can find a link to the Patreon near the end of the video description down below. Uh, and there it is, patreon.com slash Pub Talk Live. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Um, and I think we're just going to go ahead and bring on today's, uh, guest co-host. Today's guest co-host is actually the first, uh, returning host or, uh, guest for Pump Talk Live. Originally she was a, um, a special guest and now, and she wanted to come back to a guest co-host. So I'm super excited for that. So Aaron and Trina Kelly received the 2018 Newbery medal for hello universe and the 2017 APALA award for the land of forgotten girls, among other honors. Her latest book, we dream of space received six starred reviews. All of her books are junior library guild selections and have appeared on numerous best of lists. She teaches at Hamlin University and lives in Delaware. So please welcome back to the show, Erin and Trina Kelly. Yay! Hello. Hello. I'm so excited to be back. I'm so glad you're back too. Uh, I was I was really happy when you said that you would be happy to come back. So and we made it happen. All right. Um, hey Jay. So um I think I explained to you last time you were on the show, Erin, the um, the people, who, the regulars who are, uh, who watch the show, they call themselves pubbers. And so, and Jay saying hi to you. <laughs> too. Hi, Jay. All right. So, um, how is it where are you? You're in a Northern States to me, all the States are Northern States. <laughs> I right? am in Delaware. Yes. Delaware. In Delaware oh. near Philadelphia. Is it cold there? It must be really it's cold. It's very there. cold. So last week, I think it was last week. I mean, what is time anymore? But we had our first snow, mm. which I was so excited about. And <laughs> now it's like 20 degrees mm. and it's windy where I am. So it's like not just 28 degrees. It's like 28 yeah. degrees. You know what I mean? So it's cold. It's in the 40s here now, which is like, like as cold as it gets here. That's pretty cool. I mean, I grew up in yeah. Louisiana, so yeah. I, I know what that southern weather is like. <laughs> and I like being up here with all the change of seasons. And it'll mm -hmm. get much colder than 29 degrees, but yeah, it's, it's pretty chilly. Yeah, I'm just happy I have a couple days a year to wear my sweaters on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get those two days. You get to bundle yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people flee the cold and go south, you know, and I was like... That's true. I like I like snow and I like fall and <laughs> spring. So I was happy to become a Yankee and move north. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's 28 degrees in Nova right now. Wow. It's um that seems cold to me. I have lived colder places and I don't like it. I mean I like it for like a day. <laughs> and then I'm done. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't like the cold. You know what my biggest issue was, though, living in Louisiana was the humidity. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. man, it's brutal. It is. Um, yeah, I went to high school in Guam, and so I don't complain about the humidity anywhere else. But um, yeah, that, that humidity can really get to you, for sure. Yeah. I mean, hey, it was right off, right? Yeah. Hello. All right. Um, so if you haven't yet voted in the viewer poll, I'm going to put the link in the comments. The question is, how many books did you read this year? Um, and it's just like a just curious thing. There's no competition. It's anonymous. So don't worry. No one will see. <laughs> um, I am working on my 75th book for the year. So well done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're mostly audiobooks. So well, but, yeah. books count. yes. Um <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. I love my cute, comfy, <laughs> very comfy sweater. Thank you. And underneath is my shirt. It says book nerd. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yes. Yes. It's yeah. very comfy. Thank you. I am wearing a sweater today. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say something, but I forgot. I got distracted. Anyway. Uh, oh, yeah. Someone had responded to the poll on Twitter and asked if audiobooks counted. 
And um, I was like, I literally wrote a whole article on Book Riot about how audiobooks count. So, <laughs> yes. So you had strong feelings. I saw someone asking if picture books count. Of course, picture books count. Yeah. Sure, Absolutely. why not? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, and we're going to go, we're going to go ahead and get into the news. We don't have as many new news items as we usually do, but that's um, probably pretty obvious because, you know, uh, publishing was shut down this past week. Um, though last year, this time I was like, oh, we probably won't have many news items around Christmas time. And then the RWA like debacle happened. So <laughs> it's been a year already. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> it was right around Christmas last year. And we spent we spent wow. uh, probably about 10 minutes just talking about that alone. Yeah, that was some yeah. interesting stuff. All right. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Barack Obama has shared his favorite books of 2020, which he's been doing for a while now, uh, which included books like The Vanishing Half, The Glass Hotel, and Luster, among others. And now is a good time to tell you that all the news items that we talk about, there will be a link in the description after the show. So if you want to see all the books that he put on this list, you want to read more about anything that we're going to talk about, all those links will be there um, probably about 10 minutes after we end the show. And if you're watching the replay, obviously they're already there. And if you're listening on the podcast, then they're going to be in the description on the podcast as well. So uh, yeah, you can go see all the all the books that Barack Obama picked as his favorites. Yeah, I really need to read The Vanishing Half. Um, everybody's talking about it. I haven't read yeah. it. Um, so my news item is Jay-Z's entertainment company, Rock Nation, is starting an imprint with Random House called Rock Lit 101. Random House and Rock Nation plan on releasing books at the dynamic intersection of entertainment and genre-defying literature. I love genre-defying literature. Initial releases for the summer include a memoir by retired pitching star C.C. Sabathia and a book called Shine Bright by music journalist Danielle Smith, a story of black women in music combining memoir, criticism, and biography. Wow. It'll be interesting to see what kind of um, books they come out with. It looks like nonfiction right now, but I wonder if they're going to be doing some. They are planning on doing fiction and yeah. children's books, like everything, according to what I read. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Very cool. That'll be exciting. Uh, Lone Star, you read a third of Midnight Sun. Is that that's not all you read, is it? I know Jay's always yelling at you about reading more, but <laughs> wait, is Midnight Sun the uh, the Twilight Ed from Edward's perspective? Am I totally not? Is that? I, mean, I think so. Is that what Midnight Sun is? Okay, I'm I get. Sure. What's the the show that's on Netflix with George Clooney? Isn't it? I don't know anything. Does that have a similar name? I don't know. I'm so tired. <laughs> I don't know. I could be way off. I'm sorry if that's not what it is. I think it might be. I don't know. I can't I remember. Have not read. I read all I read all the Twilight books when they first came out, but then I haven't read any mm -hmm. of So yeah. yeah. Okay. Twilight. Twilight. Cool. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Haven't all right. That. What's the one on Netflix called? We'll we'll find out. Something I didn't even know George Clooney had a show on Netflix. I'm I'm so behind. Yeah, it's a movie. Um uh, I haven't I haven't seen a lot of people talking about it, and the people I have seen talking about it. Um, have said it's it's slow, so I think that's why I haven't seen a lot of people talking about it. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Like everyone's like, oh, I was. Uh, they're they're basically like, it was torture for the first thirty minutes, but then I really liked it. I'm like, mm, that's a long time yeah, for a movie. I, I, yeah, to find thirty it. minutes. No, I need I need it to be good within five minutes, or I'm bailing. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have some some good, interesting news. Uh, we've been talking about Amazon and kind of their employee relations for a while on the show. Um, and so this is just the latest development of that. Amazon warehouse workers in Alabama will be allowed to vote to unionize, according to the National Labor Relations Board. If the vote passes, this will be the first American-based Amazon facility with a union. Nice. Which, based on some of the other stories that we've covered um, this year, it seems like that might be really needed. Amazon has been, um, and especially in the UK, charged with um, actively discouraging unionization. So, like spying on people and intimidating people and that kind of thing. So, it's scary. <laughs> yes, that's not good. That's not good practices. Don't do that. Um, Post Hill Press has announced a new imprint called Wicked Sun. 
S-O-N, which will focus on Jewish voices. It will feature history, philosophy, and fiction by authors from the U.S., Israel, and Europe. Yeah, I looked that up um, at, when you had put it in, and um, I forgot what was it I saw. I saw a name attached to it that I was like, oh, that's cool. I, but now I can't remember what it is because that was four days ago on this yeah, that's <laughs> week. <laughs> I'm excited about, I'm excited about the increased, uh, you know, numbers of own voices, Jewish stories, just because, you know, well, it's own voices is needed across the board. Right. But especially yeah. stories that are not about the Holocaust and are not about world war two and are just about people living their lives. So I was excited about that. Yeah. And no uh, Jewish Nazi romances. <laughs> yes. And no, no. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't. Hey, Tamara. Glad you could join us from hey, Australia. Tomorrow. Is oh, it? Wow. It's summer there, right? I think it's summer in Australia. I mean, it's basically summer in Florida, too, most of the time. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so we talked about this in October 2019. So if you weren't watching the show then or if you forgot, um, you're forgiven. But the CASE Act uh, was added to the omnibus spending bill passed this past week, that giant bill that included um, the, um, the, the budget, the government budget and everything. Um, and uh, sorry, I lost my place. There we go. Uh, it will establish a voluntary small claims tribunal for copyright claims less than $30,000. Um, and we talked about this last year. Um, I read a lot more about like the different sides of, of the argument. Erin, I don't know if you know much about the, the current state of copyright claims. Um, I know a little bit. It gets so, it gets so murky and confusing and it just yeah. makes my brain hurt. But yeah. Well, currently it's like super expensive and hard to go after anyone for copyright claims. So unless you have the resources. Um, so that means like a lot of especially self-published authors, um, you know, smaller publishing houses, they don't have the ability to go after copyright infringement. Um, and so this is a tribunal. It's a small claims court in front of a ju judge. Um, and... Uh, it's supposed to make it easier for those like, you know, someone uses your, your, the photograph you took on a blog post or something. That's not something you're going to be able to like hire, you know, a full lawyer to do and everything. So you could do it in the small claims court. But on the other hand, a lot of people are afraid that it's going to make it easier for people to do kind of like nuisance suits and abuse the system. So interesting. I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> I wonder if that would apply to, do you remember the, the debacle with the Poet X uh, book cover? Oh, uh, yeah. I wonder if, you know, people, let's say that, that you take a photo and you post, like you say, in your blog, and then someone with a publisher takes that photo and uses it. In other words, if you're, if you're a, a small person going after the big bad company, um, I'm using air quotes, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, is, would this help that, I wonder? But I guess it just helps all around. But anyway, um, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So now this is really interesting. Book Twitter, <laughs> beloved, beloved book Twitter, was a buzz last week after the New York Times published an article about a strange phishing scam where the scammer pretends to be a published author's agent or editor and emails them and asks them to send over their unpublished manuscripts. So everyone from unknown debuts to people like Margaret Atwood have been targeted for the past three years. And the scammers seem to be familiar with the industry and use insider lingo. No one has been able to figure out. So the question is like, why? Because um, you immediately think, oh, they're going to upload it somewhere, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been uploaded anywhere. So the goal is unknown. Um, they haven't been uploaded to pirate sites or ransomed. Though some people theorize that it may be literary scouts trying to get a hold of books early. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. Jay said that's a very specific scam. scam. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's just like really excited readers. <laughs> They're just like, I can't possibly wait until the, the arcs are yeah. out. 
or um, you know? yeah, I, it it's it's really interesting. So um, we're gonna put the New York Times link in the description. So I definitely recommend you like read that because some of the stories it has more specific stories in there. Like one of them was like his editor um, emailed him and asked him for uh, after the the announcement was made in PW. The editor emailed and asked for the the updated manuscripts, and um, it was from like his editor's email address. I don't know exactly the publisher. I can't remember, but it's like Penguin Random House. Um, it's like if if they just added like an extra R, so it's like Penguin R Random House dot com, you know. And so it's like the same the person's same email address, but with like an extra letter in there. Um, so it looks like really, unless you're looking closely, you know, but the only that it had been sent to his email address that was listed on his website that he doesn't use with like communications with his editor. Mm. Um, and so it was weird. Um, and then there was another one where it was like the person knew details that hadn't been announced to the public yet about the book deal. I was like, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's really weird. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Instead of the M, use an R, N. That's right. Thanks, Karen. And hi, Karen. Hey, Heather. Um, yeah. So definitely read the article because, like, some of the examples, some of the things that happened there, I was like, it's weird. But they do talk to a literary scout and they're like, yeah, this seems like something, an ex literary scout, I guess I should say, who's like, yeah, this seems like something that we would have done. <laughs> Okay, now can I ask, and maybe I should know this, I what is a literary scout exactly? Oh, yeah, they're the people who scout um, books for media, so books for TV and, and movies, basically. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, now I get it. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, cool. So that basically, like the hot new titles that people <laughs> Karen asked. Oh, Karen question. didn't know either. Okay, yeah. good, Karen. Um, the hot that. new titles. They're trying to get a hold of them to see if it's something that their companies. This is the theory, of course, that their companies would want to make into a movie, and so they can get in and make an offer early before you know. That would make sense then for this phishing scam. I mean, it's not yeah. cool, obviously, but. Um, I guess it's good news that it's not being pirated. I mean, that's something positive, yeah. I guess. But, okay, interesting. Definitely a strange thing. Strange. Uh, all right. So, like I said, we don't have that much news this year. Um, I mean, this week. So, we're done with our news for the week. Yay. Um, and we're going to go ahead and bring on our special guest. So let's see. Reba Gordon has 20 plus years experience in elementary, middle and high school libraries in her current role as a director of the Rich Library at Trinity Preparatory School. She teaches information literacy, promotes reading for pleasure and guides students through their research processes. Reba has her BA from Vassar College and a master's of information and library science and a certificate of advanced studies in archives and record management. She is the co-creator of the TPS author festival, which over the past five years has brought thousands of readers and authors together. Rita has consulted with other schools in Florida to inspire culture of reading and her work with faculty and staff support school-wide initiatives and ongoing learning. So please welcome to the show, Reba Gordon. Hi guys. Hello. Hey Reba. Welcome. So Reba and I, um, we live near each other. We're friends. I've been an, as an author and as an attendee to the TPS Author Festival. Yes. Um, and, uh, it's really special what you have at the school. Like just, uh, there are very few schools I've been to where it seems like the kids are so excited about reading and so into it. Um, and so I just thought it would be great to have you on the show to kind of talk about that and talk about the other things you've done. So welcome. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm really glad we also discussed the fact that I have a certificate in archives. So that was obviously crucial information that apparently I wanted to share with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so Reba and I also did, because I'm an event planner for a library, we did a, a, a panel at AWP when it was in Tampa about um, successful author events at libraries, bookstores, and schools. We had some bookstore representatives there too. Um, and I think 
Reba, was that your, I can't remember if it was your or Raquel first experience with the, I have a, a more of a comment than a question person. Oh, yes, that was definitely mine, possibly yeah. Raquel's as well, but that it's actually very similar to what you get in like a kindergarten class anyway, you know, <laughs> or instead of a question, it's like, did I tell you what happened today? Yeah. yeah. But huh, that was, you handled that really well. Yeah, we, we definitely got one of those. Oh, I don't really have a question. It's more of a comment. And <laughs> and I remember Reba being like, I'm like, oh, that's that's like a trope. That's like a convention trope, <laughs> that person. Uh-huh. All right. Um, well, welcome, Reba. I don't have to ask you where the what how the weather is where you are, because it's the same as yeah. where I know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I it's exciting because it's cold. I could wear Aaron's sweater if I wanted to because it's nice and cozy and actually chilly here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you've done a lot um, to foster a culture of reading at your school, like we talked about. Can you tell us about kind of the programs and cur- curriculum you've used um, at your school towards that goal? Um, well, there's a couple of things. I, I mainly work, specifically work with teachers And when I can have like a line in with the teachers, then it's more helpful for me to, I don't want to say weasel my way into the classroom, but that's kind of what I do. And to create sort of fun programs that the teachers will want to have their kids participating in. And then perhaps more importantly, the students want to participate in. So in the middle school, we do things like speed book dating, which on the one hand is hilarious trying to explain to like sixth and seventh and eighth graders what speed dating (laughs) is, right? And then we have them do speed book dating, which is super fun. And we do an edible, I always mistake this and I say edible author fest and it's not that, it's edible book fest, <laughs> not <Yes>. edible authors. <laughs> I don't want, yeah. Um, and then we do sort of other fun things uh, with the upper school. I just, I just try and make myself very available to the students. Mm-hmm. So they're not gonna be afraid to come in and ask for my opinion on a book or just want to, it's amazing what goes on in a library that, that can happen in a library, like the resources that, that people, that the kids come in for, not only just the students, but the teachers too. Cause it's not always just like, yeah, what should I read next? But sometimes there's like a bigger issue that you can sort of worry down to figure out precisely what it, how you can help, which I think is amazing. And having Aaron, I know that you're the, the co-host here, but Having your books is also very helpful to be able to give it to middle schoolers. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I answered that. I kind of, um, I, I saw um, from Jay stories. Oh, you want question. to answer that question? Yeah, we can, we can go to that question. So Jay had asked for podcast, li- podcast listeners. I mostly read YA fantasy. What book would you recommend for a reader like me that isn't YA fantasy could be middle grade or adult? Well, my first question that I always ask is what was the last book that you read that you liked? So if you just want to type that up there in the chat, that would be good. And then usually if, and one of the neat things about having been a librarian for so gosh darn long is that I've now had a lot of experience um, in different uh, associations and, and sort of groups and things like that. So I I thought personally, I really, I was like, I only like fantasy. That's all that I want to read. I don't want to read anything else. But then you sort of have to force yourself to read other things because you want to make sure that you can actually give good recommendations to people instead of just relying on your own biases, right? And I've now realized I like to push people out of the genres where they feel comfortable. (laughs) Because you realize, oh, yeah, I do. That's kind of the whole thing behind the books. The speed book dating is your Mm -hmm you're introduced to five different genres that you have to go and date, you know, for three minutes. Um, (laughs) Sorry, I got distracted. So uh, Um, yeah, we have about a 30 second delay sometimes on comments. So it may take a minute. Um, Real quick, I realized we didn't talk about, uh, can you tell us what age range you serve at your school right now? We're sixth through 12th grade. Yeah. But you've worked with younger kids before too. I've worked with kindergarten yeah, up okay. basically they just get taller <laughs> sometimes taller and, and you, and you don't right <laughs> I do not 
I really <laughs> don't. I think I get louder. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Jay said I enjoyed Bone Crier's Moon, which I just finished, and Forge, which is an adult urban fantasy. Okay. And so you want a, more of a realistic. Do you like, um, so this is what I do with the kids and with teachers yeah. too. You know, okay, what did you last read? What did you like about it? Um, so my question would be, Jay, is that, I'm assuming it's Jay, that that's your name, not just Jay mm -hmm. Stories. It's Jay. Um, okay. Would you be interested in a realistic book? So I guess I'll wait on that. But well, I it's other... funny because Aaron's next question actually fits in perfectly to this. So no way. Okay. Um, yeah. So Aaron, if you want to go ahead and ask that, and we can do that while Jay's kind of putting together her answers. Yeah. My question. So the question I wanted to ask was, um, like, there's a certain magic in matching people to books, and I was kind of curious, like, what your you've kind of talked about it, but like, what is your matchmaking process? So you ask them what's the last thing they read. And also, you know, when you talked about pushing people outside of their genre zones, that's one of the things that I think I got most out of my MFA is that I was forced to read all different kinds of books that I wouldn't have read otherwise. So I guess kind of like it's a two part question, your matchmaking process, but then why you feel why is it important that we push ourselves outside of our comfort, our reading comfort zones? These are both really, really good questions. <laughs> but just keep me on track because I get distracted because we're talking about books now. Okay, so um, it's kind of finding the right book for the right person is, is almost like an interview. You know, I, I ask sort of what I'm doing with poor Jay, who's now been put on the spot. Um, but what's the last book that you read? What did you like about it? Have you thought about reading this, that, or the other? Another thing that's extremely helpful is the fact that I actually do read a lot. And obviously I can't read every book. I've been asked that question before. No, I can't, by a younger kid. Um, no, I haven't <laughs> read every book, but I do like, I read lots of reviews and things like that. One thing that I have on my office window is, and Sarah, I don't remember if you, if you remember seeing this, but it's little book covers sort mm -hmm. of all over the glass. And that's for two reasons. One, it's to give kids ideas of things that they can read. Like, oh, that's what Mrs. Gordon just read. Maybe I should check it out. And the other thing is to help me remember what it is that I just read, because I forget. And so if I can then look at the book cover, then it helps me to remember, oh, right, this one was about the whatever, whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just sit down and I talk to people to find out what I think would be a good fit. And then using my knowledge of books that I've read recently, um, or have read reviews about to sort of find something that I think would would work, you know. There's always that hook. There's always that at least one book for each person. And then to get out of the your comfort zones, it's important for everyone, you know, not just for people who write or, or librarians or things like that. It's important for everyone. And I served on the Florida Teens Read Committee. And so I had to read, I don't know, one million books or something like that a year. <laughs> to try and, but it was across all genres, across everything. It's check your bias at the door. It is, you know, you're going to read everything and you're going to eat. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And I know that from participating in the, the Florida Association of Media and Education's programs as a librarian, just sort of promoting it for my kids, the reason why there's, there's 15 books, but it's like so can cover a lot of genres. And there's, there's promotions and, and things like that, where if kids read all of the titles and they can win prizes, that's always good. You know, bribery, it's awesome. Um, and it forces them to read out of the genres that they're, that they're comfortable in. Because mm -hmm. you have a pre, not you, but people have a preconceived notion about what it is that they like, what is it they feel comfortable with. And when you push them out of that, people talk about windows you know, you can see into a different world. You can have a mirror where you have yourself reflected. Or I've even heard about prisms where you see yourself reflected and you can see other people's experiences reflected back to you. It's so important to expose yourself to as much as possible and to not be afraid of that because that's what's going to help you grow and and, and change and, and open your mind and to, to just really get everything, not just to get everything that you can out of life, but also to be more, to be a better person, to be more open-minded to everything that you see around you. And this is not just the only story. And I love just blowing people's minds like that because they think I've only read, I only like stories about animals that talk, 
well, guess what? There's a whole other world of books. I realize I talk a lot with my hands. I've just noticed that. That's a good thing. Okay. You're expressive. It's good to be expressive, right? Yeah, I can't. That was it. very that was very good. Yes, that was a very good succinct answer and that's a good rule for life, right? I mean, mm -hmm. push yeah. yourself out of your comfort zone, not just reading but in general, you know. Uh mm -hmm. definitely. All right. So Jay has answered some questions. Jay said, I like YA fantasy, but I want to expand my library. Yes, I'd like realistic. I recently read Instant Instant Karma, which is a contemporary magical realism, and I really loved it. I'm trying to leave my comfort zone. And then also, I love when YA fantasy has a heist, but I've never read a realistic heist book. Hmm. Okay, yeah. so... Smash and Grab by Amy Christine Parker is a realistic heist. So that, and, and it's funny, there were parts in that that literally just made me laugh out loud, which is great. Um, hold on, I'm, I'm looking at your comments too, like I keep getting distracted over there. Um, so that's a realistic heist. Other, I've got other like authors that you can, I can point you to. I don't know, Sarah, if it'd be easier if I like give them to you sort of while you guys are talking and then you can put them in the chat because otherwise a little, yes, yeah, Smash and Grab by Amy Christine Parker. Yeah, um, because I've got authors, Jay, that you can check out that are more realistic and I've got some that are dealing with, you know, people not only like learning to love themselves, but realizing that they can love other people. Like there's part, there is enough of themselves that they can give to other people. I don't, I just, I, I've been finding that very fulfilling lately. And I don't know if that's my response to 2020, but it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's good. Yeah. So how about if I do that, I will just give you some authors and things, Sarah. All right. Yeah. And you're, you're both pretty active on Twitter. So um, if Jay, if you wanted to at Reba, and maybe when you're not on the spot on live video. <laughs> oh, I'm, I've got my phone out right here. I'm, told, I'm looking right now. You're multitasking. I am. I Because this is like my favorite things. Frankly in Love by David Yoon is really good. Mm. Yeah. So learning to curse in America. Learning to curse in England. Okay, I've got to come up. That's another good uh, heist one, Jay, that you'll like. How is it? You know, it's yeah, one of no. my favorite why is this year it has nothing to do with heists was um, Darius the Great is not okay. That oh, one yes. Of, that's one of my I read favorite. the first one. I didn't read the second one. Yes, that's the first one. No. The second one is Darius. Because the there's better. Better, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah so I read good. the, yeah, so good. Yeah. And it's, what's amazing to me is how many authors have such a good sense of humor, right? Yeah. And yeah. how you can write that I'm reading a book right now. My computer's resting on it right now. I'll so show it to you. It's night music by Jen Marie Thorne. And I'm just every once in a while, like I goes against my grain completely, but I want to highlight stuff because I <laughs> love, Oh my gosh, I can't believe the way that they said that. Or, or it's just a, a beautiful way of expressing that. I'm just so envious of clearly, mm -hmm. but I, Aaron, I don't even know both of you. I mean, you write these, just these worlds. And even though it's like a realistic world potentially, but you bring us into the characters and you bring us into those feelings. How do you write the feelings so that we can feel it's, I don't know. It's just great. So you don't write in your books. Do you, do you underline? Do you like make notes? I write in mine, Sarah, what about you? Oh. Like if I see a word, no. Okay. If really it's don't. my book, I do. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you do if it's your book. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of times I it's, yeah, library See, books. That'll um, be a good. That'll be a good Twitter question one day. Sarah. I think maybe it might be because oh, that would be a good poll question. You're right, yeah. Aaron. Yeah, I think my maybe because um, like growing up, I never owned any books. Like the only books I ever had were from the library, and so I wouldn't have developed that habit early on for sure. Um. Which and I remember, like my grandmother would take us in the summers. We stayed at my grandma, who lived who lived like in the middle of nowhere. Like she did not have a street address. Like that's how in the middle of nowhere. And um, she'd take us into town every week to go to the library, and I would literally check out like the maximum number of books they would let me check out. I think it was like fifteen or something. And then you know every week I'd go back and get <laughs> fifteen yeah. more, fifteen more. So um, yeah. 
All right. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, Reba, you also teach information literacy for your students, right? Yes. Um, um, which is, I feel like I wish we could teach everyone <laughs> information literacy these days. Um, can you share with us some of the most important lessons that you teach them? Sure. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that there's been some fake news lately. Oh, what? no, really? Yes. No, fake serious. News. <laughs> I've not heard of this. Yes. <gasps> and apparently um, people are having trouble discerning what is um, true and what or what is a fact and, and what is made up. And so yeah. it's that's something that, you know, we as a librarian profession have been sort of working on the entire time, sort of, you know, helping people figure out where to find information that you can trust. Right. And then this uh, the world has thrown itself in our laps where it's like the perfect example, the perfect storm of. Look what happens if you don't verify your sources. So th thank you, 2020 and all sorts of stuff. Um, but we are, our students are lucky enough that we have databases at the school. And so we explain, or we, I am the only librarian there. I explain sort of what, I explain about sources, right? You need to understand where you're getting it from and who created it. You need, you know, and once you know that, you'll know whether you should keep going forward. And also how doing research doesn't mean finding the information that you need to support your point. It's about finding all the information, some of which you may not agree with, you know, they, but that's how you learn. And so we discuss if you find a random website, you need to figure out who wrote it, who created it, when was the last updated, can you contact someone from this random site? And I like to describe, you know, Reba's, uh, I don't know, I make stuff up. I make stuff up on the spot, <laughs> which I'm doing very poorly right now. And I know that there are websites out there that librarians use about the famous um, octopus monkey or something. And they find a website that's specifically been created for this that kids will go to. And because it's online, you assume that it's true. Mm. Hopefully not after that, they won't, but yeah. it's, it's all about, I like to obviously not just do things from far away, but to give like real world examples and have them do things along to discover along. Cause I think that gives you more of an experience rather than someone just talking at you, which I don't know if you guys have found, but this whole virtual environment has made it difficult, right? Yeah. The whole mm -hmm. One on one thing. Yeah, it's difficult. And I know when I do school visits, you know, a lot of times the hosts prefer like it be like this because it's a little bit more manageable. But I actually like when I can see all the kids faces because I can see them reacting and because it's it's difficult when it's when I don't see anyone's faces, you know, mm -hmm. so it is it is it's new. But, you know, what's one thing that, I, that I've really loved about it is that I can give a tour of my workspace well, that's something I do. I show them stuff on my desk and they love that, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's weird because you want to see people face to face. And I and I read somewhere or maybe someone told me this, that our brains, it's actually more fatiguing for us, not just because of our eyes, but because of the way our brains work. We're having to interpret and process information in totally new ways that our brain is not used to. Because we're so used to having full body language to interpret mm. the way people are talking to us. But we mm -hmm. don't have that on Zoom. So we're just doing a lot of stuff in our brains. It's making us very tired. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? that's what makes the stress of living life. In yeah, I read a, another right. thing that was about uh, it was how basically our our we're we're social creatures like humans are meant to live in groups and and interact with other people and so our brain basically rewards us when we do that right and so we get our brain sets itself up to interact with people and then we don't have that like tactile sensation of being in the same room with someone and so like basically we're just being disappointed over and over again because our brain's like we're gonna see people wow. and then we don't that's so interesting yeah yeah Hmm, interesting. Yes. We got off topic there, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would, would you like me to move on to a more uplifting question potentially or about purchasing books for your library? 
because sure. this, this is something that that interests me. So, um, and I'm sure many of you out there, what like when you're purchasing books for your library, what kinds of things? Go, obviously, you can't purchase all the books. So, how do you decide? You know, what what is that vetting process like? First, I, I always read reviews, first of all, since I can't read all the books. Second of all, I consider our circulation statistics and I figure out what kids are already reading, what holes we have in our collection. I also work with the teachers to find out what projects they might be doing. That What did they do last year if I missed it? What's coming up to see if I can also fill in any holes with that? Nice. And then it's that whole sort of prescient mind reading thing where I have to figure out what the kids are going to want to read before they know they want to read it. Um, where I think just experience comes in for that. But it's it's knowing knowing your patrons, knowing your community, and then pushing them in other directions as well. <laughs> And do you get do you get a lot of like are you often surprised do you let's say you didn't purchase this certain book but all of a sudden a bunch of kids are because I know word of mouth I'm sure especially with young readers is a big thing and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden a bunch of kids are asking you for a, these specific titles does that often happen um it does happen every once in a while TikTok people are uh, requesting or, or rating books on TikTok before I got on that, yes, I would have kids, you know, hey, I heard about this book on TikTok. And I'm like, Ooh, okay, hold on. Let me see if I can take a step back and figure this out. I I never say no. I always order everything that a kid or a teacher asks for because I just think that that's – I'm also in a di different situation. I'm in a private school. Um, so I, I'm i ordering for myself, not necessarily for an entire district or through a district. So I think right. that gives me a little bit more freedom. It's, I find it like I'm alternately pleased and challenged when someone has a book that they you're like, oh, do you have such and such in the library? If I don't have it, I'm like, ah, why didn't I think of that one first? <laughs> on the other hand, I'm like, woohoo, this kid is, you know, I'm like, challenge me, get me, you know, catch me that I don't have this book. And so sometimes it is sort of like a game. And the fact that a kid has like really dug deep to find a book that we don't have readily accessible, that, that does something to me too. <laughs> That's really yeah. cool. So you said that you read reviews. Um, what? Where do you find those reviews? Like what kind of reviews do you read? I will, I'll tell you, it's different now than it was, I felt like in real life. You know, this is, I, I, I spend a lot of time online um, going either whether it's from like author's word of mouth, whether it's from, um, like compilation lists that I'm following and seeing what they have to review, school library journal. I mean, one could even go to Amazon if you want to read a review because they actually will compile all of the starter reviews at the bottom for you. Um, I, I try not to read, and I generally don't actually read reviews from uh, sources or resources that have a bias, like where they're trying to uh, censor before the book even comes into the library. So I try and make sure that I'm, you know, making up my own mind and reading reading reviews from sources that are not trying to get me to think a certain way about a book. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it says a word in it or something. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I can, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so uh, you mentioned something, this is not on our list, but I wanted to talk about it. Uh, so, TikTok. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so I guess the broader question is like, how do you find that students are finding out about um, books? Like when they when they come in looking for a book, where do they usually get, you know, oh, that's a good question, the information from like, where do they find out about a book before they come in and ask you about it? And I wish I had the magic answer for this. I That would be incredible. I don't think I do. I can just say our kids or my kids at, at Trinity, TikTok is recent. They'll see some book influencer, book Instagram or something who uh, was talking about a book. That's been my last. I've gotten three titles that I didn't have yet. And I was like, okay, fine. TikTok, here I come. <laughs> um, also, 
their own word of mouth. If I can get one kid to read it, sometimes they'll all want to read it. If it's going to be turned into a movie, of course, you know, yeah, they hear about it that way. And social, you can't discount social media in the slightest. If an author has, you know, a publishing house behind it and they've got a lot of advertising on Insta Instagram, I mean, they're going to see it. It's just the way it is. Mm. All Sometimes right. I feel like it's my job to get the books that aren't being advertised quite so much in front of their faces. So TikTok is not just dances. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> okay. I thought TikTok was like mostly people dancing, which I love, by the way. People are always happy when they're dancing. You don't see people ever dancing and being mad about it, you know. <laughs> That's um, true. But so I thought TikTok was like, you know, I, I don't know what this was. This was like me doing a TikTok dance. But OK, so there's all kinds of things on TikTok. Too. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. give product TikTok. reviews. They do like my daughter had me doing something where I had to stick out my tongue. I don't know if anyone okay. does that one. No, it, it was just. I mean, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I'm not completely, you know, but TikTok, I got on there and I was like, OK, I'm going to do this because kids kept asking me. <laughs> went on TikTok and I went on there and it was just people dancing and I thought I, you know I don't have rhythm I, I, don't have enough, I don't have enough rhythm for TikTok but I feel like yeah early I'm on the corner of TikTok I pray early on dancing really did dominate TikTok okay. I think I need to go into but the different corner there's like of yeah there I mean there are you know aspiring comedians they do the short bits on TikTok um they there's like people who give history lessons and all oh, kinds librarian. of librarians. Wow, now you're yeah. getting it. Okay, Teachers now we're getting librarians it. give like book review things. Yeah. Okay. But in that kind of like pop culture, like snappy way, like high energy way, you know. Okay. All right. I, I wasn't in the right part of TikTok. I was in the wrong part. I, I was in the wrong part of the cafeteria. I wasn't at the right table. Lodestar said penguin teens TikTok is hilarious, actually. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so Reba, what could authors and publishers do or improve to help you with all of your efforts? What do you think that authors or publishers could do better? I guess is the real question. Do you mean for me as a librarian or me as yeah. an author fest person? As a librarian. Well, okay. I don't want to sound lame, but keep writing amazing stories. First of all, because if a story is there for a kid and I can bring their story to the bookshelf or so that they can see themselves or see a different world that they didn't even know existed, then that helps me. You know, that helps all librarians, all English teachers, anyone working with kids. That's what helps. You know, it's so important for a for a kid to see themselves, to realize, oh, look, there's other kids like me, or I'm experiencing this problem. Someone else survived it. Now I can too. I mean, it's just, so yes, having the stories available, that's, that's number one. And there's something about you YA authors that in, you know, middle grade authors, I don't know what it is, but you, every single middle grade or YA authors I, I've ever met is, they're, you're so giving and so genuinely interested in hearing from your readers and wanting to know what the readers thought. And that to me is incredible. There's another teacher at my school, Georgia Parker, and she has a, um, a young adult lit class. And part of that, a component is connecting with the authors on Twitter. And every time it just blows my mind that an author takes time out of their day to respond to a kid who's like, oh my gosh, this character and such and such and so and so is amazing. That, that sort of enthusiasm and genuine joy. And I think the kids just see the, the, the inherent genuineness. You know, you're not trying to put one over on them. That's, I don't know, that's, just keep being you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I like that. All right. We had a question from Lodestar a while back um, that uh, I have a friend who recently graduated is on the hunt for a librarian job. Any suggestions on how to best market herself for the job? 
Well, I would first join your state's librarian society or association immediately and get yourself in um, meeting other people in the field. That's gonna be the most helpful thing because you wanna find out about the jobs before other people do basically. Um, but that also, when you, you wanna market yourself by being knowledgeable and enthusiastic and you know, you like kids or you like books or whatever it is, you know, there has to be something getting into, like in Florida, it's the Florida Association of Media and Education. Make contacts, find out what is the state doing, know what those standards are, um, volunteer for things, just get on people's radar and watch for those jobs. And the same way you don't wanna cut yourself off um, from reading genres, you don't wanna cut yourself off from potential jobs because quite honestly, when I was in librarian school, I thought that I was going to go sort of a corporate librarian route. Mm. <laughs> and then here I am, you know, and I can't even imagine myself. I mean, look at me. I, I you know, imagine if I were in a law firm or something, you know, it'd scare people. But uh, yeah, I, I would, and reaching out on, you know, create that um, professional learning network, reach out on Twitter, reach out on Instagram now, connect with other librarians, learn. Um, I visited other libraries before I even got started just to see what people were doing. And then even once I got, you, you never stop learning. So uh, participate in those chats on Twitter and things like that. Um, you know, different, you know, the NCTE will have, the, everyone has them. They'll have like a Twitter chat and then you just participate in it. And that's the way that you make connections. And I see Jay, um, what's a corporate librarian? All law schools, corporations, everyone has to keep track of all of their information basically and that the corporate librarian is the one who keeps track of it and creates the system for it and and gets yeah. people the information when they need it. Yeah, my friend is a, a librarian at Lockheed Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of times she, I mean, what they do, especially an engineering librarian, which is something I've looked into because I work at a library and I have an engineering degree. Um, they're they're trying to find research on specific materials or do yeah. you have you know this paper on this specific material in this specific situation and so it's like a lot of kind of keeping track of that information all right I so saw, go ahead. You, i don't know if you just saw tamara watson um put in something interesting do you see that in the chat yeah um i was just about to ask you that so we're gonna uh, we're gonna ask tomorrow's yeah. question and we're gonna ask our last question and then uh we'll be out of time um so tomorrow asked have you ever tried to order a book and then was told it's too risky for teens and kids yes and and i ordered it anyway <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah. I know we've we've talked about Reba. You probably you might want not want to talk about it on the show, but we've talked about kind of the um the challenges that you've had at a um a school that has Christian leanings and some of the content and some of the pushback you received there. So yeah, I'm sure. And um I can tell you that Reba does <laughs> she's she's an advocate for the kids first, I think. Yeah. So yes. All right, so final question, question I ask all my guests. I hope you're ready. Um, oh. <laughs> you look ready. <laughs> that was not what the face of someone who's ready. Okay. Let me get my papers. Come oh on. My gosh. <laughs> what is the most important okay. book you've ever read and why? With you, of course, defining important however you would like. Okay. I sure, I'm sure along with everyone else you asked this question to, this is terrible. And I hate this question. <laughs> I'm just saying. And I'm a librarian and you're asking, no, there's categories, man. I can't, I can't. All right. <clears throat> so, Aaron, I don't know. How did you answer? Did you have more than one book? I, I probably did. You know, I, I kind of blanked out. I think I've re repressed the uh, memory of the question. <laughs> Because it's horrible. Yeah. I will say the first person to ever give me more than one book on this question was a librarian. It was Danielle Clayton, who had been a librarian previously. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I can work with that. All right. So here's the deal. <laughs> like the most important book for me as a mm -hmm. reader was A Wrinkle yeah. in Time. Okay. That was the first book that I read or that I remember reading where I was like, oh, 
you can feel things, you know, when you're reading. I mean, you remember that book was cuckoo, you know, but I was sucked in and I, that made me want to read. And that led to all, yes. So thank you, A Wrinkle in Time and that craziness. Um, there was a, a book that caused me to go into the profession, which it's so weird, this book at the, now, and it's a whole long trajectory of things, but it was actually Gone with the Wind. And it was dealing with my thesis and then getting irritated and then going to librarian school and then moving into the school. Like it just propelled me in a direction that I did not expect would happen. So that's interesting. Um, I have so many drug drug out. to that, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, yeah. but I'm just no, not okay. We don't want to run out of time, but now you're now not my kidding. We should chat later. With... Okay. Yeah, that was okay. <laughs> um, a most, a really, really important book for me recently. And I think that the, the books, you know, like if you ask me a YA book, what's the most important book you read, that's going to change like constantly, right? Because you guys keep producing all these amazing things that, oh, that's perfect. Um, but The Hate You Give, I mean, mm. that was a really important book for me as a librarian in a, in a private school to read. And that was something I was like, okay, we're all reading this. We had a staff book club. We had it open for students too, so that the students could hear what the teachers were saying and the teachers could hear. And it was like everyone's mind just open to, oh my gosh, this is how other people might be feeling. I, that was really incredible. That was really incredible. Um, and then I, I know we're all thinking different things about Harry Potter nowadays, but that is one that that has been the gateway series, the gateway books for so many kids that made them realize that they love reading. You know, that we, it's like the bouncing point. It's a starting point, you know, it, it, they bounce to other, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. That was, okay, I'm like sweating. That was You're very good. That was good. <laughs> that was really, that was very good and eloquent. Okay, I had notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So normally at this time we say goodbye to our special guests, but we were actually talking before the show about audiobook of the week and Reba had some that she wanted to share. Um, so uh, as I've been saying since I think September, I am judging for the audiobook awards. So I can't talk about the books I'm listening to and all of my listening time is going to those. So, but that will be over in three days. And so hopefully the first episode of 2021, I will be able to talk about a book again. Um, but Reba, go ahead with yours. Okay. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm just really just reading off of my audible list because I can't stand to not be reading and you can't read and drive a car at the same time. So I always have a book going. Um, Date Me, Bryce and Keller by Kevin Van Wine was incredible as an auto, audible book. Um, hold on, I have more. Do you know who the narrator was on that one? I can look it up and let you know in a moment. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I liked him, <laughs> or it was. Uh, Legend Born by Tracy Dion. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. go read that. That, okay. Yep, that was amazing. Um, hold on. Frankly in Love by David Yoon. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, Jay, I cannot do the two times speed club. I can barely keep my brain intact over just regular speed of the <laughs> audible books. Oh, it's, v v I can't remember how you say his first name. Vicus, Vicus, Adam. Yeah, he does. He's done a couple of books. That was for date me, Bryson Keller. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. He was really good. He was really good. He was really good. Yeah. Uh, should I keep going? Because yeah, I can. Yeah, sure, if you want to. <laughs> okay. Storm and Fury by Jennifer Armantrout. Oh, mm. that's like a kind of a romancy fantasy thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That I like that. Field Notes on Love. Mm. I listen. Oh my. That. Okay, so Field Notes on Love. Let me just. It's by Jennifer E. Smith. This book. The, the two characters end up on a train, like a train across the country together. And I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds so great. So I took my daughter, she was, she's just started in college, whatever. But so in the summer we went from college 
to New York City and we're like, oh, let's take a train. We'll stay overnight. It'll be so great. No, it was vile. It's a terrible experience. Oh my gosh. I've never laughed so hard. But this book like inspired me and I made her read it, inspired us so much about this whole experience on the train that we went to go do it too. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. No, <laughs> book was good, um, but yeah, no. We've, we've really hard. romanticized train rides in this society. I mean, honestly, they're really not yeah. that fun. Yeah. Let's just say your bathroom is in the same space that you sleep in. Yeah, it's not. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But the, on the train, the story is much better. They don't. Yeah. They don't go into the detail that I could go into right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully. All right. <laughs> and Aaron, you you had something that you were listening to. I'm listening that was to, interesting. I'm listening to the Great Courses. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Great Courses. I love the Great Courses, and I love history. So if anyone loves history, the one that I've listened to actually several times, it's called The Other Side of History, and it's the Daily Lives. What is it called? Daily Lives of something, um, and Daily Lives of something. It has a title, but. It's by Robert Garland, who I emailed. I was like, thank you for this. So what he does is he takes you through history from the time when, when man came down from the trees. And he tells you what it was like to live as an everyday person in different eras of society. So usually we hear about, you know, like the conquerors and the kings and the queens. And because those are the people who wrote things down. But he tells you exactly like if you were an Egyptian woman in ancient time, ancient Egypt, this is how you would put your makeup on. This is how you would get dressed. Oh. This is how you would worship. Like he, he takes you through all the way through the, the Middle Ages. And it's so interesting. It's like the closest thing to time travel that you can get. I love that. So is it the, it the daily life, daily life in the ancient world? Is that it? Yes. It's called the other oh. side of history is like oh, the okay. main title. Cool. Oh yeah, side. I found it. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. good. It's so good. Um, sorry, my niece is having. I don't know if you can hear. She's she's not happy about <laughs> something. Um. All right. Cool. Um. So at this point, we're gonna say goodbye to you, Reba. Thank you so much for joining us. Um. You can hang out if you want backstage and talk to us after the show is over. Or you can, you can leave if you need to. That's fine. Either way, I should have told you that before we went live. But um, that's. Either way works for me. I just want to let you know. And Aaron and I are going to do the viewer poll and then we'll we'll finish up. So, uh, Reba, thank you so much for joining us on Bye, Christmas thank weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got it. There we go. Okay. So the question is, how many books did you read this year? Aaron, do you know how many books you read this year? Yes, I have read 108 books. Wow. Look at you. Yeah, I'm... I'm nice. I think that uh, I always feel weird saying that because I think a lot of people feel guilty that they haven't read more. But <laughs> um, I, de I dealt with the pandemic downtime slash stress by reading voraciously. So that's how I dealt with it. And I have no kids at home and I don't have a nine to five and everyone <laughs> is healthy. So yeah. I have time. So I, I like to add that caveat because people have too much quarantine guilt. But I did read a hundred and wait 100 i think i'm at 108 now nice i'm on my 75th and with the deadline coming for the audiobook awards i will be at 79 in three days because of four more books to listen to there very nice <laughs> so i'll work those in uh somehow um yeah so let's see we have uh 16 of people said one to ten um 13 said 11 to 20 28 said 21 to 49 and then 43 said 50 or more this of course comes with a regular caveat this is skewed towards the people who follow me who are more likely to be avid book readers than the average population <laughs> um but yeah so a lot a lot 43 said read 50 or more which i think is uh, that's a lot you know that's a book a week or more yeah. So, um, awesome. Great, great job, everyone. And if you didn't read that many, that's fine too. It was a tough year. Um, and most of mine were audiobooks because that's just how I consume books these days. 
Because usually if I have the ability to read a print book, I feel guilty if I'm not working on one of my books. <laughs> so, yeah, I get that. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I listen a lot when I'm cooking, when I'm driving, when I'm walking, when I'm exercising, all kinds of times. Let's see what people are saying in the comments. Um, 45. I mean, 45 is great. Oh, yeah, definitely. Tomorrow I got eight. Yeah. I mean, like any book you read, obviously. I do recommend audiobooks, of course. Everyone knows that. Anyone who's seen the show more than once knows that I love audiobooks. So. I love audiobooks, too. I listen to a lot of audiobooks as well, yeah. doing those tasks. And I have to say, that's why with, with Tamara, with kids and a business and writing, that's why I always like to add that my daughter's away. You know, she's mm -hmm. she's grown and out of the house, and I don't have a nine-to-five job I have to worry about. Um, so that leaves a lot more time for writing. So. I mean, not writing, reading. I mean, writing too. Yeah. <laughs> I do both, but yeah. Let's see. Karen got 42, goal of 46. Nice. I mean, you still have time. You have a couple more days if you want to get those in. Uh, Lodestar, Jay, have a talk with Lodestar, please. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I know she does all the time, so that's why I say that. And Tamara currently cleaning the house while listening. Yeah, it's a great time. All right, let's start. We'll talk about this later. All right, Erin, thank you so much for joining me for the second time on Pump Talk Live. I had a yes, great time fun. talking to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm just going to close out the show. I'll say goodbye to Erin and um, I'll see you on Twitter, Erin. <laughs> you right. can also yeah, hang out too if you'd like. All right. Um, thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss another episode right down there. Also, tell your friends because that's how they find out about shows like this. Um, you can also support on Patreon at patreon.com slash pump talk live. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Um, I don't know. It, I don't think I mentioned it while we were live, but my laptop charger broke this week. Uh, and so I'm currently using a second computer. I mean, n like not my computer, uh, to do the show. So I ordered a new one. And so, but I remember when I ordered it, I was like, I'm glad that I don't have to worry about costs like this with my Patreon supporters. So you do make a great difference. So thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, the social media for both Reba and Aaron is in the description. So make sure you go check them out on Twitter and wherever else they are. Also the link for the TPS author festival is in there under Reba's name. So go check that out. Not new laptop. Sorry. Just <laughs> new cord. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the new laptop would be a, a bigger thing. It was just the cord that broke. Um, and uh, upcoming, we have Wednesday write-ins every week at 8 p.m. So if you're working on anything, if you're writing, if you're editing, if you're blogging, um, we even have people who just come and like, uh, you know, do whatever they need to get done that week on the computer. So feel free to join us for those. And, um, and then I have two agent chat lives coming up in the new year. I haven't yet nailed down the guest for the first episode of um, Pump Talk Live in January. The second episode of Pump Talk Live in January will be at 4 p.m. because my guest is in the UK. And so um, we wanted to do it live. So we're doing it at 4 p.m. So just a heads up on that, the one in a month from now, basically. Uh, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Everyone stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, and I'll see you next time.